In 1847, a shocking murder at the top levels of French aristocracy sparked not just a national scandal, but eventually a revolution that brought the government crashing down. So what happened? This is the truth of the French murder that started a revolution. The July Revolution of 1830 allowed Louis-Philippe to seize the throne with the assistance of the upper middle class. By 1847, King Louis-Philippe of the House of Orléans had been king for 17 years, but his time was almost up. Within a year, another revolution would see him deposed, forced to flee into exile. The Revolution of 1848 was just one of many revolutions that took place across the whole of Europe that year. Most of them had common instigating factors, with the middle class rising against the nobility for several reasons, including economic depression, food shortages, and unemployment. In France, though, the road to revolution had an added element, as it was kicked off in parts by a scandal surrounding a shocking murder. A murder even more shocking, given it started off like so many do as a love story. Francois Fanny Altaris Rosaba Sebastiani and Charles Udeabord, also known as the Duke and Duchess of Soiseau Poisson, were married on October 18, 1824, and had nine children over the course of their 23 year marriage. Theobald, Duke of Choiseul Poisson, was born a few months after Napoleon Bonaparte became the King of Italy in 1805. He was a politician as well as a member of King Louis Philippe's court. He served as a member of the Chamber of Deputies from 1838 to 1842 and was named a peer of France in 1845. The Duchess was Marshal Horace Sebastiani's daughter, who was a distinguished general according to the annual register for 1847. She seemed more invested in her marriage than the Duke, as she wrote about how madly in love she was with her husband in her correspondence. Despite this, their relationship could be explosive, and the Duke had at least one affair. She also accused the Duke of hiring a governess in part to drive a wedge between the Duchess and her children. So while everything seemed like a storybook romance on the outside, inside the marriage it was a different story, and things were about to boil over. The governess for the Poisson children was Henriette de Luzy. She had been with the family for several years, but by the middle of 1847 at least, the Duchess had become convinced that de Luzy was having an affair with her husband. Whether that was true or not, we don't know, but ultimately the Duchess fired de Luzy in an attempt to solve the problem. The governess didn't leave Paris, in part because the Duchess had refused to write her a letter of recommendation. Without that, de Luzy had a hard time finding another job, which in turn made it hard for her to afford to leave. It made de Luzy a suspect, but it also made her a first-hand witness to history, and her version of the story was still being told almost a hundred years later, thanks to books and films like the 1940 hit All This in Heaven 2, which showed all the sordid events in true old Hollywood style. It was only, only a matter of a letter from her. I kept hoping she would send one I wrote so many times. The Duke and Duchess returned to Paris on the Corbeil Railway after visiting Poisson. The couple separately visited friends before returning to their rooms and were about to take another trip to Dieppe. Their ground room floors were separated by an antechamber. At around 4 or 5 in the morning, the Duchess's maid heard the bell ring, signaling that her mistress wanted something. The maid rose to assist, but found she couldn't get into the Duchess's room. When the servants finally got the door open, they found a horrific sight. The Duchess lay in a pool of blood with severe wounds at her throat and across her body. According to the annual register, she was, quote, horribly mutilated and dying of her wounds. A table was turned over and porcelain was spread all about the room, as was blood. Pieces of hair from the person who had attacked her were scattered around the room as well as held in the Duchess's fingers. When the Duke was alerted, he immediately came in and embraced his wife's body. Despite surgeons assisting, though, she died two hours later. The events of the short night would go on to have repercussions for all of France in the months to come. The murder had happened on a Tuesday morning, and police searched for information for several days. Authorities quickly discovered there was no evidence of breaking and entering, even through the garden, despite the fact that there was an open window which initially suggested that an assailant might have possibly entered or exited through the garden. According to the annual register, blood had apparently been found on the Duke and in his room, though he had embraced the Duchess's body, which might explain where the blood had come from. The police then found out about the Duke's affair with the English governess Henriette de Luzy, and officers began to look for her to start an interrogation. In the meantime, the servants were questioned, revealing that the Duke and Duchess's relationship wasn't as rosy as it may have appeared to be, with the two living separate lives in the same house. Finally, a servant reported that he had seen someone, roughly the same size as the Duke, opening that window to the garden in what may have been a cover-up attempt. Due to the supposed affair and the fact that the Duke and Duchess were living separately at the time, suspicion fell squarely on the Duke and his purported mistress, Governess de Luzy. She, at least, had a happy ending. 
Though she was questioned and imprisoned for three months, she was eventually released, moved to America, and married a famous author, the Reverend Henry Fields. While there was no evidence of her involvement, though, the same was not the case for the Duke, as the weight of evidence quickly made him the only real suspect. One of the Duke's pistols had been found, with a ball loaded, and it was also covered in blood and pieces of human flesh. Plus, when the servants found the Duke that morning to tell him the Duchess had been attacked, the Duke was reportedly washing his hands, the implication being that he was trying to remove blood. The two halves of a bloodied, broken sword were then found separately in the Duke's room and in the garden as if thrown. The Duke gave no explanation for how they could have gotten that way. On top of it all, Charles had also discovered to be wounded on the hand and leg. The evidence was mounting up, and the police had no other obvious leads. The Duchess's murder was so gruesome that everyone wanted the case to be solved as soon as possible. When the general public heard of the murder of the Duchess, they were horrified, but they were also strangely excited at the fact that the Duke was the prime suspect. The general feeling among the regular people was that the nobles had been getting away with all manner of crimes for so long, shielded from the law by their wealth and power. So the fact that a high-ranking member of the courts was to be held accountable for a murder caused a sensation. Because of his position, the trial also threatened to upend matters at court, so the trial was rushed forward to cause as little disruption as possible. They wanted to get the spectacle over with and move on. The court of peers assembled that Saturday, August 21st. After deliberations, the Duke of Choiseul Poisson was questioned. However, his health was failing rapidly, and it was discovered that he had apparently taken arsenic in order to commit suicide. The Duke was promptly given a strong emetic to try and purge the arsenic from his system. That same Saturday, he was moved to prison. His health fluctuated over the next several days, but on August 24th, he was found dead, apparently poisoned, having never admitted to the crime or explained the motive. Your suicide is your answer. We only require a confession of your motive. Was it not your guilty entanglement with Henriette de Luzy that drove you to the madness that possessed you? Did the Duke commit suicide out of guilt for his actions or fear of having to take responsibility? No one knows for sure. The Duchess's body lay in state before being buried, while the Duke was buried with little fanfare. The scandal came at a bad time for King Louis-Philippe and his court, who had lost the trust of the people due to a number of political and economic disasters in recent years. And the death of the Duke infuriated the people even more, as it was widely believed that the Duke was allowed to commit suicide in order to avoid the spectacle of a trial and public execution. It was seen as another sign of the nobility being above the law, and as 1847 turned into 1848, talk of revolution increased. Strikes and public protests were already banned by the crown, but protesters had developed another avenue of gathering support, Campagne de Banque, which were private fundraising dinners designed to get around the injunction against public assemblies. In February 1848, though, the king and his cabinet also prohibited a pro-democracy banquet that was to be held in honor of George Washington's birthday. It proved to be the tipping point. Riots broke out across Paris, and the mob stormed the palace. The king was forced to abdicate. Almost overnight, a revolution had formed and succeeded. Louis-Philippe abdicated in February 1848, and afterward, the revolutionaries arranged a provisional government. However, the new government proved to be disorganized before the elections in April, while strikes increased. The middle-class bourgeois wanted democratic electoral reforms, while radical socialist leaders desired a social welfare republic. Most of the people, though, wanted to find some kind of middle road. The result was conflict and confusion. On the one hand, the revolution had brought together many different groups who were united in the feeling that the old regime had to go. But on the other hand, once that regime was gone, there was no consensus on what should replace it. The Second French Republic officially adopted the motto, Liberty, Egality, Fraternity. By contrast to that sentiment, the man chosen to be the first provisional president, poet Alphonse de Lamartine, seemed more like a benevolent dictator than someone truly supportive of those democratic ideals. The major goals of the provisional government were job loss relief and universal male suffrage. In March 1848, the country gained millions of new voters when it gave all men the right to vote. Government goal complete, France. Political clubs began to pop up all over the country, including for women, though they didn't have to vote. The country elected mainly moderate candidates in April, as opposed to the liberals who had started the revolution in the first place. The election results led to a brief insurrection in June led by workers, which lasted for three days. They felt that the new moderate government wasn't addressing worker concerns and they were angry. In the resulting violence, some 1,500 workers died, and along with them, it seemed, died their hopes of a socialist republic. Still, the provisional government enacted a number of social programs in an attempt to address the crippling unemployment the country faced. But they didn't have the money. 
So they put taxes on land, which alienated small landowners like farmers and peasants. As a result, the new taxes were simply ignored in many rural areas as uncertainty about the new republic built. The Constitution of the Second French Republic was ratified in September 1848, but it was weighted toward executive power, and it offered very little to assist the Constituent Assembly if there was a disagreement between it and the President. The people of France may have desperately wanted a true republic, but it seemed they weren't going to get it. After the revolution that brought the Second French Republic into being, former King Louis-Philippe was forced to flee France and settled in Surrey, England. He died there in 1850. That same December, Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of the famous French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, was elected President of the Republic. According to Britannica, the Constituent Assembly passed measures in the next few years that trended toward conservatism, such as depriving one-third of men their right to vote. Bonaparte argued against that, believing himself to have the support of the people being disenfranchised. As his term was coming to an end, Bonaparte also pushed to have the Constitution amended to allow him to run for a second term, feeling he had the mandate from the people. But when this failed, he took matters into his own hands. In December 1851, he staged a coup and seized power, and a year later declared himself Napoleon III, the new Emperor of France. Perhaps it's fitting in a way that a revolution born from murder would itself have such a short life. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.